Ladies and gentlemen, let me promise you something very profoundly before we start the podcast of today about the friend archetype. This episode, this video, this audio is going to be the most profound, meaningful content that you will ever find out there on this subject. And the reason that I feel very confident about this statement, this promise, is because I have been researching the friend archetype and there is no a lot of this subject. Most of these ideas and realizations and conclusions that you will be learning in this episode are based on profound discussions with my wife, that she's also a clinical psychologist, um, from my own meditations, from my own research, interconnecting different aspects of friendship, psychoid dimensions, psychology, social psychology, archetypal constellations, literature, fiction, psychomythology, different areas and trying to do kind of a hybrid of what is really the friend archetype. So you have my permission. If you don't find this episode the most profound ever on this subject, never consume my content again. Erase me from your social media. Spit the scream in my face. I give you permission. If you see me on the street, ask me to fight you. <laughs> I was eating chocolate. Hmm. Ask me to fight you. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, chocolate before a podcast. Not a good idea. <laughs> um, so that is my promise with you. I am not telling you this for bragging or to brag. No, I'm telling you with a lot of proud on my work and a lot of conviction that after this podcast, you will understand very profoundly why you need a friend, why your psyche creates a friend, what is the shadow of a friend, why the loss of a friend hurts you so much, what is the psycho mythological purpose of a friend in your life, how a friend can make you better, how a friend is organized with others, archetypes like the warrior, the lover, the king, the innocent, the god, the self, the witch. And you will most importantly know and discover who is really the most important friend that you can have in your life. For this and more, my friend, welcome to the friend archetype. my friend, to the most transformative podcast in the multiverse. This is the Mastermind Podcast Challenge Season 2 with your host, your favorite doctor of all time, your archetype of a friend, your papacito of Puerto Rico, Dr. Derek Israel, and this is the episode 
500 and, oh, sorry, 608. Before we move forward with episode of today, um, let me tell you, I have a reproduction list in the description of this video that is called Archetypes. And there you can go and you can see a bilingual list of all the episodes on Spanish, some of them on English, some of them of the archetypes that I have discussed. I discussed the witch, the magician, the lover, the king, uh, the friend, uh, the shaman, um, the persona. So, and I will be continue, I will continue adding on in the future systematically. So, hey, if you are interested, and you like my approach and you like the profundity of the ideas that I expose, check that out. Um, so let's start by my favorite part of this podcast. So if you are just listening to the audio, please consider to go to YouTube right now or maybe watch the screen in your Spotify station because I will be showing you some visuals in the screen right now. And these visuals are basically famous friends in fiction. Of course, as you know, archetypes are always found in fiction because they are energy that is expressed on art very naturally. And um, sometimes by you understanding friends in fiction, you kind of learn a lot about the archetype. So here are some of them. Uh, leave in the comment below some of them that I may be uh, left out because obviously I cannot put here all the friends on fiction, but these at least are some of them that I like. So here, one of my favorite is obviously Hermione, Ron Weasley, and Harry Potter. So obviously these guys are very, very, very close friends. They go on adventures together. They are magicians. They are the witch. And yeah, you can... Um, you can feel the energy of friendship archetypally, archetypically with them. Also, these two guys here, uh, Buddy and uh, I, Bud Lightyear, and I, I uh, what is the name of the other Buddy? I forgot the name of the cowboy man. But yes, from Toy Story, these guys first they are enemies, right? In the first one but then they become best friends and they portray a lot of this archetype. These are my favorite best friends. I almost cry with these two guys. <laughs> Goku and Krillin from Dragon Ball. So they stick to be friends until Dragon Ball Super and moving forward in the cities. So yeah, they are very, very, very close friends. Also these ones, on Han Solo from Star Wars and Chewbacca. So they also uh, kind of are very, very best friends. And also you can kind of understand that Chewbacca is not human, but he's a friend. So you kind of know that to be a friend, you don't need to be a human. You can be a creature, you can be a frog, you can be an animal, you can be an alien, you can be whatever. You can be a, even a ghost, right? Um, and be a friend. These are very popular. I love this one, Despair, Bart, and Milhouse. <laughs> I love them. They are very, very bad boys, you know, um, and they are very cool together. Uh, I, I, I also love these ones. Um, Peter Griffin, Quagmire, Cleveland, and Joe. So these are from Family Guy. They are always together, always drinking beer, a lot of adventures with them. They are very funny, and they portray a lot the archetypal energy. This one, I only know this one on Spanish. They are called Los Tres Chiflados, the three slower, something like that on English. But I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But yeah, they are very old. My dad is a very close fanatic of this series. I, I was not kind of a fanatic, but when I was kind of uh, thinking about the French archetype, I, rem I, I remember these guys, like they're always fighting with each other, but at the end of the day, they are pretty good friends, right? So I put it there. Uh, also, this is a very classical movie. Uh, it is called Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey. And the other one is very famous as well, but I don't know his name. And they are also very good friends. I just want to have a little bit of representation of the girls. So, um, I see. I saw this series. Maybe I saw the first season, or maybe the season two. I didn't finish the series, but this is called Pretty Little Liars. 
So I remember that they were two friends, right? So maybe you can watch the series if you want. Um, and this group of girls, they portray a lot what is friendship. And finally, this is a very famous Hispanic um, uh, novel, like TV novel that is called Betty La Fea, like Betty the Ugly, maybe in English. And obviously she's Betty and um, the guy is uh, Nicolas and they are best friends and they are very good friends. He's always protecting her. Uh, she's always giving him advice. They, you know, they are, they are a good definition of what is to be a friend and the archetypal energy of friendship is very present on them. So leave a comment below with other friends and in that way we can kind of have a better list. So, but the most important aspect of knowing what is a friend archetypically and psychologically is to look at your own life, right? You don't need to only look on fiction. Look at your own life. Who is your best friend? And just connect with that energy. Just notice you will feel something in your heart when you, when you think about this man or this woman. Or maybe they are two best friends or three, or maybe they are a group of friends. And just notice how beautiful is that energy. And just try to meditate a little bit. Maybe you can pause the video or maybe you can do it further on when you, when you end the video. But meditate, what is friendship? What are the constitutions of friendship? What is the role of a friend in your life? And most importantly, what is the archetypal energy? The psychological foundational energy that a friend moves dynamically in your psyche. It's a very important meditation. And folks, this was the beginnings of this podcast, you know, um, I started watching a lot of movies in a cinematic exploration and I saw that in a lot of movies, the friend is very important. And I was asking and I was telling my wife and also uh, this exploration in my personal life came because my most popular YouTube video so far is on Spanish and it is called what to do when a friendship is over, right? Something like that. And um, in Spanish is que hacer cuando se aleja una amistad. And I was telling my wife, like, why so important friendship? Because I have a best friend. I have some friends, right? I don't have any social problem having friends. But I didn't understand, like, really, as a psychologist, as a human being, as a fanatic of the archetypes and the Jung Jung work, I didn't understand why. Like, why a friendship is so imperative for the psychological constitution? And I have been philosophizing with my wife this night after night after night and that awakened on my mind the exploration and i have been in the last months meditating on this researching on this and now this is the fruit this episode is the fruit of my research and my exploration but um by exploring in my own heart these questions about friendships and what is a friend psychomythologically this was the root of this episode. So I invite you to do the same, to explore this in your own life. Not just take what I will say here and take it or leave it. No, no, just this is a continuous exploration that you need to continue doing in your life. See. So what is archetype in a nutshell? So look, a very, very important kind of Definition, I always define the archetypes differently in every episode. Why? Because it's a dynamic concept. And I always try to bring a metaphor. It's the best way that you can understand it without going very deep in Jungian psychology and deep psychology. Just imagine a river and that river, that river has a channel, right? Like a morphology. And the water on that river is energy. Well, the energy and is kind of your psychology, is kind of um, the psychological energy, the libido, how your mind works, the fuel of your mind, and the fuel that is 
driving your psychomythologic narrative, your imagination, your dreams, your fantasies, even your personality, of course. But the channel of that river, the morphology, the structure, how curved it is, how straight it is, that is the archetype. So the archetype is kind of a, a structure for the energy, is, is kind of a skeleton that will provide that will provide energy a certain form. And those skeletons, those channels of the river, those morphologies, those structures that are so are the energy itself, because they are the structure and also the function, they are repetitive through different psyches and even in the collective whole, in the collective mind of the whole humanity. So you are going to experience them. I am going to experience them. A human being from the 3000 is going to experience them. The guy that was living in the 200 before Christ experienced them. We all experience them in different ways, but with the same kind of structure. Okay, they transcend time, they transcend space, they transcend context, they transcend culture. So a friend, a friend, not socially, but archetypally, psychologically, but not only in your thoughts. When I say psychologically, let's say psychically. It's more profound than just psychologists, than just cognit cognition. It's more profound. You see, I'm talking about the structure. I'm talking about the foundation, the gods and the goddess, the goddesses that are bringing the movement and the dynamics of your being. You see, these never die and a friend is part of them. Exactly as the warrior is part of those archetypes, the queen, the witch, the persona, the shadow, the buffoon, the trickster, you see, the shaman, the priest, the lover, different archetypes. So basically an archetype is a structure and a functionality of your psychological energy that will drive your experience. That is in a nutshell. So very important. This episode is not about friendship as a social dynamic. In the future, I will do an episode of friendship. What is friendship socially? What constitute a good friend? Uh, how to maintain a friendship? Blah, 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 blah. I will do that, of course, because I realize maybe this is very profound and I don't even have kind of a a more simple episode about friendship. So I realized that later, I will do that in the future. Um, so stay tuned. But this is not about friendship, this episode. This episode is about the archetypal constellations and dynamics of a friend. So this is more profound than just a social friend. This is not about how to maintain your friend, you see. This is about how your psyche created a friend in the first place. Why? How? For what? What is the structure of a friend in your existence? Notice the profundity of this material. Let's go. So why a friend is important? Why? What do you think, my friend? Why a friend is so important, psychically, archetypically? Well, it's so important because if you have no friends, you are all alone in the multiverse. This is very profound. This is exactly as the question, why God created the universe? Why? Well, one of the potential answers is that he created the new universe because he, if not, he was all alone. So he created the universe to have something to have a relationship with. So the psyche, aka God, the creator, the psychoid, the germ of existence, the psyche and, and the cosmos is the same. 
The psyche creates a friend. Because it needs something to speak with, to talk with, to relate with, to have fun with, man. To fool around with. What do you do with your friend? <laughs> to fool around. And this is very, very important because you may say, oh, Derek, but, but um, for example, in the Genesis, in the Bible, Like God didn't create friends, God created lovers. So if the psyche or the psychoid really wants to create a relationship, why not a lover? You know, at the end of the day, the lover is more primal. The lover is more effective because you can reproduce with the lover. You can uh, propel new evolutionary forms with the lover through reproduction. You can have Uh, you know, sex with the lover, you can fall in love. Why a friend? Because lovers bring too much drama. Just watch Adam and Eve, man. <laughs> you know, how many drama? The apple, blah, blah, blah. They're both kicked out. If they were friends, not lovers, we will steal in paradise. Do you understand this? Probably. We will steal in paradise. But they were lovers. So we are here on earth. Obviously, this is a metaphor. But I'm trying to use, you know, that myth to illustrate the point. I am not saying that the friend come first than the lover. That is not my point. Probably, you're right. Probably the lover comes first. But then we realize, or God realized, the psyche realized, oh, you know, I love this woman, I love this man or whatever, but I need another thing, another thing that is not sexual, that I don't desire, another thing that is just to play with more, like without the drama, without fornication. So it creates another type of relationship, a friend. So I'm not saying that the friend is more important than the lover. I'm just saying that they are different. And of course, if you know something socially, not even archetypically, socially, friends and lovers, they are not the same. If you think that you can make your lover, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friend, you are screwed. It will not work. They are not your friends. They are your, your lovers. And if you think that you can just have sex with your friend and still be friends as something normal, you will screw up the relationship as well. Because one of you two will fall in love. And then if you cannot consolidate the relationship, probably the friendship will suffer and maybe it will end. Not every time, but most of the time. Just try for yourself. You know, if you have a friend, stick as a friend. If you have a lover, stick as a lover. They're different. Exactly with your son and your daughter. They are not your friends. They are your son and your daughter. That's it. Sometimes we try to enact too many roles in relationships. Enact only one role. Father, that's it. Grandfather, that's it. You're not a friend. So your grand, uh, for example, <laughs> your grandson will want to go to a party and you have 80 years old and you will be dancing in the party with 17 years old because you are his friend. Dude, get out of the club. Go and meditate on a cave. Go and become enlightened. You're almost dying, you know? So be the grandfather. When your grandson is with the hangover and he wants to go and sleep and to drink water and to eat something nice the next day, he will come to you, the grandfather, you know, because that is your role. It's not to go and party. I am not saying that you cannot do it sometimes. You can do it. You know, you, you can have fun, but the roles are very important, socially and even more archetypically. 
So that's why the friend is important because we need some something to have a relationship that is very meaningful and that is not sexual. That is the most critical point of the friend. That's why Hermione and Harry, they didn't have sexual relationships, only in the mind of Ron through the spell. But then when Ron noticed that he was not the friend energy towards her anymore, he was the lover energy, they became, you know, partners. And that's it. They are not friends anymore. They are partners. They will not be the same. And sometimes friendship can evolve to, um, to love, to lovers. I don't know if lovers to friendship, maybe, but the two at the same time, it will not work most of the time most of the time, you see. And remember, when sex is a thing, as in the lovers, and I have a lover archetype, you can go and watch it, uh, an episode about that. When sex is a thing, trust me, drama is a thing. And this have a very evolutionary reason for it. Like when sex is a thing, you can get pregnant, you can have kids, and that brings drama. Who is that kid? Uh, of who is that kid? If you're a woman, you know it's yours. But if you're a man, you can never know if it is yours. Only with a DNA, DNA test, that is a modern invention. So archetypically and in our evolutionary psyche, we don't know about DNA tests. We only know that if that woman is pregnant, maybe yours or maybe not. So that is a drama. So everything is a drama when, have, when you have sex. People fall in love, people get obsessed. And when you share uh, sexual energy, I have a course about sexual mastery if you want more information about this in directisrael.com. When you share sexual energy, you are not so only sharing orgasms, you are sharing the most vulnerable part of your personality, it's the sexual part. And, um, and when you do that, You bring all your trauma, you bring all your pain, you bring to the bed all your suffering as well as all your pleasure, as well as, as your love, as well as your erotic energy. But by interchanging that, you are not only transactioning sex and orgasms, you are transactioning souls. And that brings drama. You see. But when you have a friend, that is not an issue. You don't have sex with your friend. You see, that is not an issue. It's only assistance with assistance. That is what is a friend. An assisting, an assistance, a psyche, your psyche, for example, coexisting with another psyche in perfect harmony. Most of the time, if you are good friends, right? Like in a parallel growth in the psychological evolution. Beautiful. That's why it feels so beautiful in your heart to think about a friend. So why the psyche needs to create a friend? I already answered that because it's all alone. And it's bored. And it needs iterations. It needs middling. Just imagine if your psyche doesn't have any friend, it will be kind of a kind of a black space with nothing in it. You don't have no one to communicate with, no one to share your secrets, no one to have. Uh, good memories with is kind of a very, very lonely life. And if you have a lover, well, you have sex, you have kids, that's it. It's kind of a very, very empty life. The psyche will be very sad without a friend. So it creates a friend to feel happy, to feel connected, to feel that it matters more than just a reproductive egg and sperm. To feel 
that have a sense of belonging. That's a very essential word. And that's why socially we need to belong to groups, to organizations, to fraternities, to the church, to the community, to the nation, to the army, to the government, to the Democrats, to the capitalists, to the, to the right, to the left, whatever. We need to belong. It's a very social, primal energy, but that comes from the archetypal nature of a friend. I need something that is alike me, something similar as me to relate. That's why the psyche manifests a new form. Uh, I don't know if you are a fanatic of Dragon Ball Super, but there is a, a scene and something that happened in Dragon Ball Super in which the god, the most powerful god of all, is kind of a kid. And he creates a, a version of itself, but in the future. And then they are friends. So because the, because the God was all alone, he created in himself, in a, he replicated himself in another thing just to be a friend with, him, with himself, right? <laughs> kind of crazy, but yeah, that is basically the structure of a friend. You are a friend with yourself because everything is one. It's only one consciousness, you see. It's only one psychoid. It's only one collective mind. But in that mind, you are split in friends and also enemies. That is the warrior archetype. The warrior archetype needs, needs an enemy, right, to fight with, you know, uh, with followers. Also, you create followers as a king because if you're a king and you don't have followers, you're not a king. Uh, you need a lover as a lover archetype, you know, and you create stuff just to relate, to relate. So understand that the friend archetypically is a correspondence balancing principle. So uh, psycho psychologically in the archetypal realm, you have a lot of tension if you are all alone because the whole libido, the whole psychic energy is concentrated in one dot, one point. We call that enlightenment. You know, when you basically reach nirvana, And I recommend you to watch one of the best documentaries spiritually out there that is called Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds. Uh, you can find that online and you can find that in Gaia.com. So when you reach Nirvana, when you reach heaven in Christianism, when you reach salvation or enlightenment in Buddhism or Hinduism, basically you are again in one point consciousness. Is all the power of consciousness in one dot, you see. And it's, it's in balance, but then as entropy says, it start like getting unbalanced, unbalanced, and with tension, with tension, with tension. That is, that is basically the structure of creation. If tension is not there, you create nothing. If you don't have tension that your professor will put you a zero in the world, you don't do the work, right? When you have tension, you create. Resistance is indispensable for creating. Even your spirit and your and your uh, and your skin and your body is here in tension, in resistance. Your spirit is resisting your skin, and your skin is resisting your spirit, and that makes you a human being. Everything comes from tension, even. Reproduction comes from tension. When you have a lot of tension, 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 you explode in an orgasm. That orgasm may create another human being through conception, you see? So tension is essential. So it needs to balance itself. So it creates another cell, just as a mitosis or a meiosis, you know? Bloop. It creates another cell. It creates a friend. Go to stu and study mitosis. The second cell, and then four, then eight, you know, 16, blah, blah, blah. Those are friends. 
in a cellular level, is the is the principal. It's not a friend. It's like it's not like the cell will say, "Hey, what's up, cell?" And the other cell will say, "Hey, what's up, cell?" <laughs> you know, no. It's the principle of division and unity. Division as a correspondence is something that is coming from the same source. Is the same thing as the corresponding principle from the Kibalion, what is above is below, is the same thing. But it's two aspects of the same thing. I remember the Roman god, I forgot his name now. Nanus, Tanus, oh man. Mm, ah! I forgot the name, but it's a, a Roman god that portrayed this nature of two things being one because it's a god that is one face looking this way and the other face is looking the other way, but it's only one coin. The same as the cross and the face in the coin. It's only one coin, two aspects, two friends. So it's a correspondence principle that needs to balance itself because it's so concentrated. It's a kind of a big bang. When just let's go with the paradigm of the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, it was only energy, right? Only, only nothingness. And then boom, friends. It divides. Reality divided, exploded itself in different planets, blah, 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 blah. Different chemicals, different atoms, molecules, uh, gases, or whatever, 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 whatever. It needs friends. It needs to balance itself. And some of the theory says that the universe will contract in itself again and it will create this point of concentration again and will divide again. Beautiful, huh? <laughs> it's cosmologically beautiful. What is a friend? It's cosmologically beautiful. It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. So what is the role of the friend in your mythopoetic adventure? And when I say a mythopoetic adventure, I say also the hero's journey. If you are familiarized with the Joseph Campbell work or maybe the archetypal constellation or the narrative that you are experiencing in your unus mundus, in your one world, in your created cosmos, in your created multiverse. Well, I think that to illustrate this point, it's very good to read one of the masterpieces of the Hispanic literature, Don Quixote. So if you read Don Quixote, you know, you have the principal guy is Don Quixote and the, you have the other guy that is called Sancho Panza. So Sancho Panza is friend, you know, it's the archetype of the friend. So he's basically the role of, you know, you have this visionary, He's living in his mythopoetic life. He thinks that he's a, how do you call these guys? Um, a knight. He thinks he's a knight in Don Quixote. But obviously he's not a knight. He just, he's a crazy old man that he's lost, he's lost in his mythopoetic life. And because he read a lot of books about being a knight and stuff like that. So he thinks that he's living in that world. But he's going for an adventure and he's decided to do that, man. He's going to conquer his mythopoetic narrative. He's going for it, even when it's not socially valid, right? Or re in reality based. But he has a friend, Sancho Panza. So what is the role of Sancho Panza? The role of Sancho Panza is to go and conquer whatever that thing he's going to conquer whatever Don Quixote is going to conquer, even when the friend doesn't know what the hell is that. You know how beautiful this is, bro? So just, you know, when you have a friend in your own narrative, in your own experience, sometimes your friends are crazy, man. They are into something that you are like, oh my God. Even when you're having beers, drinking, they will do something and they decide to do something and you're like, okay, I don't agree, but you go. That is the role of the friend. Sometimes your friends are going to get into a toxic relationship and you're like, I don't recommend you do that, you know, 
But okay, man, I go with you. I support you. That is the mythopoetically the role of a friend to go in your adventures with you. Even with that adventure, it makes no sense at all. That's beautiful. If you don't go with your friend, you are not a true fan. You are an acquaintance. You are someone in the, you know, an extra in the movie. You are not Ron Weasley that basically he doesn't have anything to do with Voldemort, but his friend is Harry Potter. So because his friend is Harry Potter, he's going to fight with the most terrible magician, black magician of the whole universe. You see? Because he's his friend. And even when Don Quixote gets to fight with drunk men thinking that they are billions kidnapping a princess, you know, Sancho Panza will fight, will fight as well because he's his friend. Exactly as if, you are, if your body is fighting, you will fight with your body even when you don't know even why you're fighting. That's a friend. That's a friend, man. Beautiful, huh? <laughs> beautiful. <sighs> It's a beautiful journey, man. So this brings me to a question that I don't have a definitive answer. But my wife, she thinks that the love for a friend, look at this thing. The love that you feel for a friend is the most Pure love that you can feel of all. And hey, that's a statement right there. I don't know if this is true because, for, for example, you know, you can have the love for God. You can have the love for your children. You can have the love for your lover. You can have self-love, right? But she say, and she's a clinical psychologist as well, um, She said that nothing breaks your heart more than a breakup with a friend. And judging by my YouTube channel and the fact that in my most engaged video is about this, it may be true. I have videos about, you know, when you are heartbroken for a couple, like for a partner. You know, when you are uh, having trouble with your children or with your father from the perspective of the child, of the kid, right? Uh... I have videos about scarcity of self-love and conflicts in your own self-esteem. Those videos, they don't run as well as that of the friend. Why? I don't know. It may be. It may be that the love for a friend is one of the most pure that there is. And just bring to your mind an experience that you have of a friend breaking your heart. If you have ever go, gone through that experience, how does that feel? It's terrible. It's terrible. It's like you are broken half. Sometimes when you end a relationship with a lover, yes, you feel down. It's horrible as well. But with a best friend, when you fight with a best friend, that is a whole new level. Why? Maybe that the most pure love is from your friends? I don't know. That is an open question. What do you think? Leave in the comment below. Uh, leave your opinion there. So, hey, remember, my episodes, these are not definitive conclusions. I am not that narcissist. This is a, a work in progress. I have a, you know, 20 years, uh, 20 years, no, 28. <laughs> I'm 28, so... I'm still learning a lot. So maybe in 10 years, I can do a second episode about this subject and I can have a more definitive answer. For now, this only is a question. I don't know the answer. But also what I know is that the friend is a source of trust and protection. This is essential. So one of the... One of the reasons why the psyche created a friend is because it needs something or someone 
to trust. And sometimes your partner, it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill that role. You see, because there's a lot of dynamics with your partner. There is sex, there is uh, monogamy, maybe there is marriage, political stuff, morality. There's so many other psychological factors that sometimes trust with your partner becomes difficult and is contaminated. But with a friend, it's straightforward. Don't betray me. I don't betray you. I trust you with all my heart. You know all my secrets. And that's it. Straightforward, man. You're my best buddy. We have each other's back. Right? Right? So this is very important because what is the opposite of trust? Annihilation. If the psyche cannot trust, it will be eradicated. It will disappear. It needs a grounding. Do you know why you trust science even when science is not perfect? Because you need to trust something. Why you trust God? Because you need to ground your beliefs, your reality in something, you see. Psychologically, this is a need. Why do you trust me? Because I am a psychologist. And why do you trust a psychologist? Well, because I study. And why do you trust that if someone study is trustworthy? You know, why do you trust that? Have you ever questioned why you trust? Because you need to, man. You need authority. You need to trust to feel secure in a psychological world, in a psych, in an archetypal constellation that is frightening because it's so mysterious, it's so enigmatic, it's so unknown, it's so unconscious. That to acknowledge that you don't know, that to acknowledge that it's mysterious is, man, you cannot do that. You prefer to have a source of trust. And the friend gives you that and also protects you from danger, protects you from annihilation. Also, this is very important. A friend is a tool for accountability to stimulate psychological evolution and growth, AKA competitive principle. So you will understand that if you have a friend, you will be competing with your friend. So my best friend, In my personal life, he's a he's a he's a killer. He's a dog. Uh, what I mean, he's a very competitive man, and I compete with him in everything. I compete with him um, in Call of Duty. I compete with him in basketball. I compete with him uh, in pickup with girls. I compete with him in everything. And he was my best buddy, man. But we mirrored each other in competition sometimes. And we get better by doing that. Also, women do this with each other. They support each other. Uh, they, they uplift each other. But at the same time, if your friend is getting very fit, you will feel like, man, I should get fit as well, you know, because she's getting healthy, blah, blah, blah. You influence your friend to get better. If you're not influencing your friend to get better, is that your friend? Probably not. Probably, probably it's a toxic friend or it's a shadow friend. And I will talk about the shadow friend because every archetype has a dark energy, dark pole. You see, you can do, you can be the shadow king. You can be the shadow witch. Uh, just watch my, uh, the witch archetype uh, episode. I did that yesterday. Amazing. Even if you're a man, watch that because you need to activate the witch. Even if you're a man, if you're a woman, hey, this is a must for you. But if you're a man, you know, so, um, so yeah, the competition in friendship is important. It's imperative for our whole evolution. Also, the friend is a mirroring principle, as I told you, is something that is showing you the way, showing you what you can be. And also he can show you what you can, you don't want to be. Like now I'm getting old and now sometimes I see my old friends and I see their lives and I'm like, 
I love them, but I don't want to pursue that type of lifestyle, you see. So they are mirroring me different potentials that I have in my own unus mundus, in my own phenomenologic experience, in my own life, in my own destiny, in my own narrative, in my own mythopoetic uh, journey. And I'm like, I don't know if I want that. For example, uh, a lot of my good friends back in the day, uh, we were drinking buddies. And we were a lot of nights party, into parties, into hanging out. And now some of them, they keep that lifestyle, but now I'm more into the hermitage. I am more in the, you know, the chaman archetype journey. I am more in the king. So I don't want that. So they middle me a potential that I still have latent in my, in my, sometimes I want to go, sometimes I want to party, but they middle that in a way that, okay, I don't want that anymore. And sometimes those same friends, they have other traits that I say, oh man, I like that. So they, they serve me as an example. So this runs both ways to the things that you don't want to develop more in your psyche and the things that you want to develop more. So in that sense, they are kind of a mirror to you. Also, I just want to mention that the friend can be a shadow. And this is very sad. And the shadow friend is the traitor, is the friend that basically betrays you. Why the friend betrays you? Well, he can be possessed by envy. This is very common. Also, he can like your woman or your man. This is very common. So they can be possessed by the shadow of love, by the shadow of the love archetype, and they can let that destroy the friend archetype. And they want your girl, man. They want your man. And they will go for it. And you will say, hey, dude, what the heck? And you will fight. You know, if you see a lot of the mythopoetic um, movies, for example, The Northman and also um, maybe Hamlet, a little bit um, Star Wars, Anakin versus Obi-Wan, you know, the, yes, there is a mentor, uh, pupil kind of, but sometimes the enemies at the end were friends at the beginning. Just notice that. Just notice that. It's because friendship can go wrong. You can be possessed by the shadow. And the sad proportion of the love that you felt for your friend, it will be the exact proportion of the hate that you will feel when he's your enemy. Believe me. So you will go hard towards him. So don't be that. You as a friend, never become the shadow. Respect the boundary. Respect your friend's partners. I have lost friends because they cross the boundaries with my partners. Um, I have lost friends because they got jealous at me with my success. And I'm like, dude, man, I, I believe in you. Like, why you let, you know, our energy to be so contaminated with your own psychological unmature tendencies? So, yeah, that is my whole journey, my own journey. But that is part of the journey. You know, the shadow archetype is there always and it's contaminating, it's influencing. Remember, it's the devil. He's tempting all the other archetypes to become something that they can be, but they don't want to be. For example, to the lover, to become an addict, to the wish, to become an attached to beauty, attached to uh, youth, uh, to the king, to become the shadow king, a tyrant, you know, to every archetype. So go to my reproduction list and watch the other episodes and you will be more informed. And the last point and the most important point that I want you to understand that the friend that is the most important in your whole world, in your whole Unus Mundus is yourself. This is the most important friend. It's yourself. When the psyche understand that even in an external form is itself. But more than that, itself without the external form, the psyche with the psyche, existence within existence, the archetype without dividing, the one cell, the one point, single point, nirvana in nirvana, consciousness in consciousness. That's how you become the perpetual motion machine. I have an episode on that. You know, 
that is how you become something that can go forever because you are lo localizing your control internally, not externally. You are not depending of, on a friend to have a friend. You are your friend. You are your lover. You are your God. You are all the things because it's only one archetype and it's all the archetypes at the same time. And that is the self. I don't have an episode on the self yet. Maybe when you watch this, I have it. Check that out. But yeah, the self archetype with the capital S is all the archetypes in one. The most important. It's kind of the sun in astrology, right? It's the most important. So you are your most important friend. So this was Dr. Derek Israel. If you enjoyed this, leave a comment below with your thoughts. I really want this episode to become a discussion for the age to come. I'm pretty sure that I deliver on my promise. If I didn't deliver and this is not the best thing that you have heard about this subject, leave a comment below. Tell me where you, where you find another thing that you may think is better because I really want to research it. I really want to study. I really want to comprehend this phenomena better. I'm doing my best. Um, stick around for more episodes like this on personal development, uh, spiritual evolution. Also, donate on Patreon. You can just donate $5 per month and that helps this podcast to continue free and to support my research and my work. The link is on the description. I also have a Telegram group. You can join. It's free in the link in the description with people that like this kind of subjects and we are working together for exponential growth. Um, also, go to DerekIsrael.com. There you will find everything that you need to work with me. Maybe you want me to guide you in your archetypal journey. I have a service that is called your spiritual guru. I can do that. I can activate your archetypes. I can guide you to do that um, if you want. Also, I have the um, coaching program with me. If you want to establish better habits, better mindset, a more solid lifestyle, maybe you can hire my coaches, coaching personalized service on Spanish or English. Uh, so I have the psychotherapy. If you live in Puerto Rico, you can be my client. Also, you can go there and enroll in my courses. I have a life purpose course. I have the sexual mastery, self-love course as well, meditation, hyperproductivity, integrity. Um, what else? Um, yeah, and also I will be publishing my books there. There are, uh, there, there are a, a couple of books that I will be publishing very soon. So yeah, go to my directstyle.com, check the store. Support this work. Uh, keep growing with me. Um, and I see you in the next uh, episode. Thank you.